Hello, everyone, and now welcome to episode number 14 of Verdict, uh, Verdicts of the Ancient Kings, Salt-Filled Tears. Another crazy, crazy week has come, uh, come by as today is November 21st or the 21st of November, depending on where you hail from and how you read your dates. Alongside me, I do have Nico Sharp. Nico, how are you doing today? Good. A little tired, but I am still alive. Yeah, but I I just think like the holiday seasons, it's it's always more festive. And now that I have kids, I realize how much the holidays are for the kids. And you and you try to get everything ready. And wow, I I need to say thank you to my to my parents when I see them this holiday. It's just like you went through a lot for me when I was small, and I had no idea. Yeah, for sure. All right, so let's go ahead and dive straight into um, this week's episode. Uh, last week, we put up a puzzle out there, and it turns out there were two solutions, and people were filling in both. Um, I, I think you were giving them a, a dual entry if they found the second or found both solutions type of thing? Yep, did a dual entry for all those folks, and um, most people found both. There's a few that only found one, but... Um... Yeah, so I guess like I'll just quickly dive into the solution. So um, this is a puzzle up here on the screen right now. You can see that um, we had given you a ton of cards in your hand. And uh, the first solution was Play Razor's Edge, Cog the Petals, uh, Thirst, and Soul of Battle all on your Regis Paladin. That would have pumped it up to an 11-8 with Swiss Strike, I believe. Mm -hmm. and, and then you would have dealt... Um, exactly 21 damage with Crush, which is basically what the riddle is asking you to do. Black, blackjack damage is 21 damage. Mm -hmm. the, the second solution was the more complex one than the one we were hoping you'd find, which is play Crackling Boon. So the Crackling Boon would pump up your damage. Oh, I'm sorry. I actually wrote the order of that in the wrong way. Um, let me see here. No, that's right. Yeah, play Cracking Boon. So that'll pump up your Righteous Paladin to a 9-8 uh, with the Mesotonomist proc as well. Mm -hmm. You play the Soul of Battle on the Righteous Paladin to give it crush and double damage. Then you play a Star Shield on the enemy Righteous Paladin because if you see the Righteous Paladin on the enemy side, he also has, when you gain health, um, heal or when you take damage, heal. Mm -hmm. So um, you don't want the Mesotonomist to get Swift Strike and heal that Paladin, so you give it Star Shield. Okay. Then you play a Razor's, um, Razor's, a Razor's Edge. Edge on the Zombie Vulture so that it deals damage to your Paladin first, and that will um, make it so that your Paladin heals. And and then be, instead of just being a 9-8 it will be a 11-9 with, um, with Crush and double damage. So mm -hmm. that's how you'll deal with 22. So a little bit more complex, but um, that was the solution we were hoping people came up with. So you'll see down there on the bottom, we um, I selected three winners based on, I think we had 16 entries, all oh, of them right. correct. So um, Aaron... Um, Aryan Wind, Wastelands, and Auden's, you guys all got lucky. And um, Crota, I guess, will decide what your prize is. Well, I'll, I'll just go down the list right there. So the Grand Prize winner will be Aryan Wind. Um, you get your choice of the three. Um, most likely, I think you're going to be choosing Gax because that seems to be the very, very popular mercenary out there. Wastelands, you'll get to choose between Brozai, Book, and Portensio. And then uh, Odin's, well, you get, you get whatever is left over. And and leftovers in this case is still like, you know, 1,200, 1,500 plat leftovers. So um, those are pretty good leftovers, better than some Thanksgiving leftovers that are out there. So hopefully you guys <laughs> do enjoy that. Um, Arian Wynn, um, please contact me. I'll, I'll be contacting each of you three in the game when it is your turn to pick. And we will go from there. So I'll be litter littering my desk with those like scratcher shaving flakes that all end up all over the ground because i keep on scratching those as prizes anyways moving right along we're going to be going into some of the reveals that happened over this past week and cleric tier two was um one of the bigger reveals that re that really uh sparked a lot of discussion um that and the plunder dome which we'll talk about next um what did you what did you think about cleric tier two and the especially the holy hands talent that was released 
Yeah, so that is probably my favorite talent out of all the talents I've seen so far, just because, you know, being able to make copies of something in your deck mm -hmm. um, and that many copies is going to be really fun to play around with. And um, I think, you know, I was pretty active on the forum thread about this particular talent. And I think we've identified like three or four cards that are going to be incredible with this Holy Hands talent. One of them being Dream Eagle, mm -hmm. because Dream Eagle with its equipment allow you, allows you to basically dig through your deck and pick, you know, one out of four cards that you want. And you can just keep cycling that. And then if you combo that with something like Call the Grave with the Trinket equipment, mm -hmm. you can then get all your Dream Eagles back out of your crypt and just keep doing that. Um, the Holy Hands talent, if you're playing a super large deck, Four copies of a card in your deck with hands equipment will equal 20 cards in your deck if it's 100 or more. So if you play a 100-card deck and you have four Dream Eagles in there with gloves equipment and holy hands, that would be actually 20 Dream Eagles in your deck. So you have to be a little bit mindful, too, of your resource curve because you're creating that many copies and putting them into your deck. So you have to rebalance your resources factoring in those copies as part of the deck. Yeah. And one of the things I like about the Dream Eagle is it it actually kind of solves its own problem of your deck getting too large because you're able to drill down through your deck. So you're like, oh, I'm making my deck really, really large. But at the same time, you're going to be able to get the cards you need. And if you want to get cards into the discard pile, like the Dream Eagles, or or you have something that triggers off of troops in the discard pile, such as Oberon's Eulogy, you can um, use that to fairly good effect as well. I know there's a lot of other cards. Um, sorry, it's the Crypt. It's not the discard pile. And you can pull yeah. things out back out that way. Also, um, if Cleric needed another reason to be just that like easy mode, giving them armor as well making it that much more difficult for them to even sustain damage and um, it's looking like cleric is going to be perhaps one of the easiest ways to play but ne not necessarily the most efficient and and i'm really really curious as, as to how all of those players out there you especially nico are, are gonna try and find a way to break um, you know like whenever there's an event being able to run run a dungeon in, in under 10 minutes and i know you can i know you already have some ideas with those upcoming dungeons depending on whatever they're going to be and um, building for us in chapter two yeah and i'm not sure cleric is a class to really do speed running with now because their whole second tier is really focused on extending the the number of copies of cards in your deck and making blessings more powerful. Mm -hmm. Those cards um, are cantrip cards, so you're going to have to play them and wait for them to resolve to get your next card. And it, it's a nice effect, but I, I kind of like what they did with the, the second tier and the focus because everything is going to make Cleric more powerful, but also make them slower at the same time. So they're not going to be the most desired class for content clearing yeah, in terms of speed. Yeah, and maybe they're maybe they're like the tortoise and the tortoise and the hare. They're going to be slow and steady. It it's going to take things take time for things to resolve, but in the end, you'll be able to get there and get it done. Yeah, definitely. It's going to be one of the stronger classes, especially when you pair it with clerics that already have one armor, and then you get the talent to get a second armor, and then you're just negating all this damage every turn until you you win. Yeah. All right. So moving right along, the the next big announcement is the Plunder Dome, uh, the Platinum Plunder Tournament with, uh, well, the ninth place Salty Sleeves coming out in December. And there was actually a lot of discussion about this particular tournament and the prize support for it. I know you were active on the message boards. Why don't you give us a quick rundown of of what was talked about, what what some of the complaints were, or some of the concerns. Actually, concerns is probably a better word uh, regarding the Plunder Dome and Salty Sam as the swashbuckling mercenary. So the the major complaint for this particular tournament is that they're giving away a mercenary that's exclusive. And and originally, you can see in the prizes, they're only going to give away 128 of this mercenary. And they never specified, you know, if this tournament would ever be repeated. So um, PvE players, more specifically, more so than PvP players, were kind of panicking, thinking, oh my god, this mercenary it, it is cool, I kind of want to play it, but how in the world am I going to get it, and what do I have to pay for it if I want it, if there's only 128 of them in existence? It would, it would have been the most rare merc 
that we currently know of in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, so there were a lot of people kind of in panic mode and not happy with the decision that Hex had made to give away PVE rewards for a PVP event. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, the PVP players, they already get chests that have PVE stuff in them, including a lot of the mercenaries that we already own. But that I think that was a primary complaint. Like, you know, if you're going to start doing this exclusivity for PVP tournaments, you know, why are you making the PVE cards only obtainable in that format? And um, I think Hex had just made it clear since the beginning that they've always wanted to make cards hard to obtain. Mm-hmm. And now they're starting to expand in the ways that they're doing that. Um, it's nice that Corey said that they are going to instead give this mercenary to the top 256 players. And with their player base still being fairly small, that might be about 50% of the player base um, for that particular tournament. And then the tournament will also be held in the future. So we may see Salty Sam in the future. I also just really like the ninth place prize. I think that's hilarious mm-hmm. that they're giving away a sleeve to one person that's a salty sleeve. Like if I won that sleeve, I would only use that sleeve for like ever. So it, it's pretty cool. I like how it's kind of black and white, but then with the the text in blue, it, it just looks nice. Yeah, I, I think it's it's like a lot of people out there were like, I want the consolation prize, that that salty sleeve. How do you position yourself <laughs> for that specific sleeve? And, you know, it, it's going to be hard to do. And, you know, like, it, I don't know, you you felt a little salty when you got ninth place in the first Cosmic Showdown. Yeah. And, and I know you're like, you're looking at that sleeve like, I can, can you retroactively give it to me? That That's <laughs> such a perfect sleeve for how you feel. So, yeah. Um, and I, I know that Corey and I know a lot of the people had their concerns and, and I looked at and I had the same concerns as well, um, especially with Gax out there already ranging from three to seven thousand plat. And that was a fairly readily available um, mercenary um, back in, I believe, 2014. So having one mercenary only be 128 was a big, big concern. And doing a little bit of that cross rewarding um, is something that I actually I actually kind of like um, the fact that you want your PvP players to try to experiment some experiment in some PvE. That's not a bad thing. And also, if um, if you guys were keeping track of today's specific release, um, the Kraken. There's an alternate art Kraken, which is a PvP card, a, a legendary yeah. from set one that is you can earn alternate art in chapter two somehow. We we don't know yet. But somehow, some way, some shape and form, you can earn an alternate art PvP card in PvE. So um, I guess bridging that gap a little bit, I'm not saying that Kraken is tier one. I actually believe Kraken is about to be rotated out. So maybe they feel that they can do that or maybe they'll include Kraken just because it's part of Chronicles of Entrath Chapter 2. But uh, yeah. I, I didn't include that as a slide. I was thinking about that, though, because I, I, I thought about that earlier today as well. This, that, that was interesting that I saw that crack. I'm like, hey, that's the first PvE, PvP card that is more than likely going to be available in PvE. So I, um, I see how they're kind of trying to bridge that gap. Um, I think it's hard for some of the players to stomach that um, don't see themselves on one side more than the other. So... Or, or that see themselves on one side a lot more than the other and, and don't want to venture into that gray space um, of being on, on both worlds, uh, so to speak, because you do kind of have to keep up with the PvP meta to make that work. And then PvE does kind of have its own like little meta game as well. So um, you have to really diversify your play if you want to be able to acquire everything in the game. Yeah, and and I'll also speak from personal experience, and you might you might be able to chime in on this. Sometimes, as as a PVE guy myself, like I do like I do a lot of PVP limited, and I do a lot of PVE. Um, I get I get trigger happy with the F10 key in PVE, and it comes to bite me in PVP sometimes. I, I think in my last draft, I hit I had hit F10 when I wasn't supposed to, and I couldn't make my Twilight Revenant invincible in a fight, and. It it just went all downhill from there. So, um, there there it, it looks the same, but you really got to be be careful how you play PVE and PVP as well. Yeah, and I think I mentioned to you I lost the seventh round of the Cosmic Crown Showdown, and why I got ninth place is that I actually had a misplay where I F10 skipped my turn. 
And uh, yeah, that was uh, pretty demoralizing. But it happens. It happens to everybody. And yeah. if, you're, if you're using hotkeys and you just have to play as slow as possible. Yeah, you, you got to just take your time and breathe and, and remember um, what really what you're looking at. For those of you guys who haven't seen Salty Sam, this is the mercenary. Kind of a weird shard grid, more rares and legendaries than commons and uncommons. But you can, can include hard shell humans or minotaurs for copies. And you should also be getting plenty of charges as well. Anyways, moving right along to a mercenary that we are spoiling for you guys. This is Roofkin Bone Spike. 24 health. We don't know what the starting hand size is, but um, its upgraded collect bounty text is really where, uh, really where this particular mercenary shines. Uh, why don't you go ahead and and speak into the into Roofkin Bone Spike? Sure. So yeah, the the upgrade text is really the kicker here. It, it allows you to ramp. So um, there's several ways you can make use of that. You can play um, cards that deal um, damage, like Burn to the Ground, maybe um, the Life Siphon from Blood. And there's just, you know, you, or you can just play more cards from your hand. So what you kind of want to do with this particular guy is play removal, but you also want to play cards that potentially could either go to your opponent's side or um, will somehow trigger troops to go onto your opponent's field because then you can make use of your basic two cost card that that gives that opposing troop a death cry so um i put together a little deck for this spoiler for rifkin and um, minotaur mercenary is really the perfect card and that's why i think he also has a one shot with minotaur mercenary what minotaur Mer mercenary does for two is it, it decides one of two things it's either going to come into play as a four three for you or it's going to go into play for your opponent as a 2-1. So it's, it's a troop that you could immediately put your turn 2 death cry trigger on um, and, and even create him as a one-shot if you don't have him in your hand. And um, and then you can trigger the death cry with various removals. So you can see in this deck we're playing um, Crackling Magma for um, with the boots equipment, which makes it one cost. So you'll be able to quickly remove a Minotaur Mercenary if it goes onto the opponent's board. We're also playing Heat Wave to do two damage AoE. And then we have various other things in the deck to either bring back our troops or wipe the board, um, including um, some fun with uh, Kindling Scarn to um, create actions and put them into our hand. And then we have some Recursion with Rise Again. I think the coolest thing I, and why I wanted to play Blood initially is for Fungal Monstrosity. And mm -hmm. Fungal Monstrosity is a... Um, was a hard to obtain, I think it was a chest roll from either set one or set two um, card that you could obtain that says, when you play this, put five Shin Hair Jailers into play for the opposing champion. So basically, with, with that particular card, you're creating a bunch of cards for your opponent, and then you can use your charge power to make one of those have Death Cry and then just remove them with like a Crackling Magma or a Heat Wave. Um, and then those Jailers, if they're still in play, you can't attack with Fungal Monstrosity. But once you wipe them all out of play, then you can start attacking. So this deck, because it has a removal for those Jailers quickly, you can easily attack with your 12-12 Crush pretty much after the turn you play it. So um, I thought it'd be fun to, to try something like this out. Yeah, this is one of those decks where you really need to fine-tune, you really need to play with, and... And it's, it's going to be interesting, to say the least, to try and um, get an idea. We have a lot of information coming at us very, very fast. We're, we're looking at all of these cards, and, and we all have these great, great ideas, but it's still all kind of up in the air, and we won't really know until we get to the meat of everything. Um, hopefully, in the next couple of weeks, we, we all have our own theories on when Chronicles of Entrast Chapter 2 will be coming out, and we've been told it's sooner rather than later, so... And let's hope that is going to be the case. And hopefully, I'm hoping for a big announcement this Wednesday. I know I said that last last time, and there was no super big announcement. So I'm like, oh, it's got to be this Wednesday that they'll finally announce a release date. What do you think? Do you think they'll announce a release date on this Wednesday, or something to be thankful for, or do you think it's they're not quite ready to pull the trigger? Um, I think we'll see a release date on. 
on Friday. I'll say Friday. I my guess, and this is still just a guess, is it's going to be the second week of December. Mm. But it just it just seems to make sense for it to happen then. Um, for whatever reasons I'm making up in my head, it, it just seems like the second week of December would be the perfect time to launch it. And I, I think they're ready. So um, we'll we'll see. We'll see. I'm I'm hopeful that we'll get to play it sooner than later. All right, so going through the rest of the crazy number of mercenaries that were released, we have Festi. Festi is um, a, what upgraded text is a fire juggler. When a resource enters a crypt, deal one damage to each opposing champion. And its skill manipulation is each champion draws two cards, then each champion discards two cards. I believe that is of choice. So um, that is something that you can do. And then Festi, you're also allowed to put your crypt into your deck. Um, one crazy thing to wonder, can you actually just make an entire deck of resources and, and win with Festi? Hmm. I don't know. I, it would be pretty challenging. I mean, you still need charges to use your charge power, and you'd still want things to kind of control the board. Yeah, but, crack, um, crackling vortex yeah. and a couple of charge bots, and and maybe yeah. some primal essence to get a little, you know, get better ramp. But that that'd be interesting. Whether or not you could have a have a resource juggling deck that that just tries to um, tries to mill you, or I guess mill yourself until you kill your opponent type of thing. It could work. I, I think there's probably better combos to try, but that that definitely could work. All right. What was your thought when you first saw Festy? Um, I guess I was thinking more just, you know, play mill, you know? Um, if you can squeeze in enough mill cards, um, you can even run a bunch of all the ruby cards that, that draw multiple cards, like uh, Fiendish Kabbalist, uh, Psychotic Anarchist. Impulse. Impulse. Imp uh, Impulse as well, yeah. So you can you can even discard cards that way. Um, you could even play Crowd Roars. You could just go crazy with it. So you can just quickly go through your entire deck. And then using the re repeat performance, mm -hmm. um, if you're playing Impulse with its equipment and Crowd Roars with its equipment, you can quickly throw in you know 12 or 13 cards by turn three or four. So that repeat performance is going to help you out a lot um, once you start training off the, the discard effects from those cards. Yeah. All right, looking, moving right along. The only reason why like, I didn't like Mill for Festi is it didn't have enough Sapphire, and that's where we see a lot of those Mill cards. But moving right along, we're going to take a look at Hovis O's Shearskin. Um, mercenary very, very heavy on the Ruby and also has the Berserker counters. Uh, what, what's your thought on the Berserker counters and on what is some good scenarios to use these Berserker counters? So the Berserker counters um, in this particular champion, um, from what I've seen, is a mechanic so that you cannot lose early to ag aggressive decks. Um, however, you know, there is a limitation there where you know, you still will lose half of your health and you cannot gain health. So what? how do you make sure that you don't have too many Berserker counters stacking on you? Um, I hope I'm thinking of the right counters, right? That's the one that, um, yeah, Berserker. Yeah, at the end of your turn, remove half, half of your Berserker counters, round it up. You lose one health for each Berserker, Berserk counter removed this way, and you can't gain health. Yeah, so it's so basically what you want to do in this deck um, with this particular champion is you want to play a super aggressive face slime deck, and you want none of your troops to be blockable, um, if possible, and you don't care about how much they're attacking. So basically, you're going to want to just go face, go fast, and and win. And um, with the berserker um, counter ability you are buying yourself at least maybe two or three turns until you'll die where you can just continually go face. So it might be really good in like a Sly Huntress deck where you're building up with Ruby Pyromancers, things that you don't want to chump block with. Mm -hmm. And um, and then all of a sudden you just play your Sly Huntress for the win um, or something like that. And um, it's really great with the Wolvir Bashir that um, basically his charge power represents is you know based on how many tr troops you're attacking with 
it gets attack equal to the, that number of troops. So if you have something with crush, like a quash that you put that on, mm -hmm. um, you'll win very quickly. Um, Stingshot Sniper, also good. A lot of the popular um, Ranger-themed Ruby decks right now will do very well with this particular champion or mercenary. Yeah, and adding in the fact that at the start of the game, two random deck, random troops in your deck without speed do get speed is, is going to definitely help as well. So this is just going to be very, very fast out of the gates, trying to mow down their opponents. And I know a lot of people out there are wondering, can, can I use this mercenary in Frost Ring Arena? Um, I don't believe we've heard anything about mercenaries in Frost Ring Arena, and I would assume no, as champions are currently not allowed in Frost Ring Arena. Yeah, I think they do have some interest in, in pursuing that as an interest um, for for players, but it, it might not be the same arena we know and love. It, it could end up being some version of that in the future that we see. Yeah. So more to come on that. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the Frost Ring Arena was revamped in in the next couple of or I, i'll just say in the next year because the year is very very long I, I think a lot of people who have been playing um hex for a while has have gotten pretty much everything that they can possibly want out of the frost ring arena short of promo stardust you can never get enough promo stardust at this point that's <laughs> true moving right along the clatter clank um well you you are the expert on this one since you did write the the mercenary guide for clatter clank 150 card decks with a full shard grid so yeah the full shard grid is awesome the charge power when robots trash is very game breaking in some ways because um, there, there's a lot of um, conversation going on right now about clatter clank and ways that you can build him i think yasi revealed that you might be able to just go with um ozawa and um and you can use some other party passives from some of the other revealed mercenaries to give Ozawa like flight and speed so that as soon as you use your charge power, you're going to have a crazy Ozawa coming into play with life drain, flight and speed, and um, can immediately hit the opponent in the face and gain health equal to that damage. So it'll be interesting to see what happens to Clatter Clank. I think we'll see a secondary deck building requirement maybe added on to the card before its full release. But um, I think as is, his, he's going to be a lot of fun to play. And um, people are going to come up with all sorts of decks of him, even if his um, charge power remains without any other deck building restrictions. All right. So so what you were saying was if you had the party passive where you have uh, Hovis, Hovis in your party with Clatter Killing, you had a deck that only had uh, uh, Ozawa and... 149 resources you could play yeah. and crackling vortexes you can maybe get him now maybe turn three because you can get you lose the coin flip and you gain an additional charge and he immediately kills your opponent or gains you tw 26 life and you have a 52 52 on the board yeah th yeah yeah um there and there's some other champions that are even better than hovis like i think there is um the spirit of the trine virate right? i think is the one that gives you um Three troops in your deck get flight, life drain, and speed. Um, we'll we'll talk about it later, but I think that's one he was thinking of. And then there's another one that like gives you a guaranteed charge power if your deck size is larger, so you can start with a an additional charge. Yeah. Um. So you can do the combo a little little bit earlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you can see there, spirit of the trying to right. your party passive instead becomes at the start of the game. Three random troops in your deck get speed, flight, and steadfast. Yeah, and then the Clatter Clanks party passive that you were mentioning is at the start of the game, if you have more cards in your deck than each opposing champion, gain a charge. And with Clatter Clank, you are most likely going to have more. Um, I was talking with Kyle about this, and um, he was running Clatter Clank in, in his party, and he just had a 61-card deck just to have a 61-card deck so that he would start the game with, with an extra charge. So things to consider, things to play around with as we move straight along to Finnis Pith. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, or I'll read this one. It, it's a human rogue champion. Add a hitting counter to you so you can't be targeted or attacked. 
and target opposing troop gets death sentence, which is a key word that we've seen a lot of cards on. I think it's something that we can expand on in a bit in PvE. But what I really wanted to talk about was um, this is a human rogue that actually uses blood magic. Um, are you are you surprised by that? And, and the fact that you can include rage troops in your deck where only the ardent, um, only orcs use blood magic on the ardent side, and and they're and they're very ragey from what I can gather. Yeah, thematically, uh, I wasn't sure about this guy. You know, when I first saw this card's name, I immediately thought of the. Um, the guy in the new Star Wars movie, um, the the bad guy, uh, Han Solo's son. I don't, I don't know why why I thought about him, but like I think the name kind of had like a similar ring to it. Anyway, I I don't understand the backstory to this particular guy. Why he's a human rogue? Why he has a specialty in blood and artifacts? Mm -hmm. But I think that you can make pretty good use of him, especially with the hidden counters. Um, if you build around it very specifically. So my I haven't built a deck for this particular Mercenary yet, but if I was going to build one, I'd build a, a charge theme deck that um, focused on using my hidden ability as often as possible and, and probably going with like some sort of mill mechanic as well. Um, and then also probably dumping in a bunch of life drain troops because you only have 13 health. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's kind of how I was thinking about building this particular mercenary when I first looked at him. Yeah, I, I'm going to be curious as to how we're going to be earning some of these mercenaries. Perhaps there will be quest or some sort of story engagements where hopefully you can like flesh out and get get a feel for the mercenary that you're using. And I am particularly interested in this one, the human rogue, and and hopefully. Well, hopefully we're not reading too much into this, and there is actually something to read into as we move right along to Mother Dawnbreeze, um, a little bit more thematically um, along the same lines as, of what we think of as an ardent cleric. 25 life, very high life already. Basic charge power, gain 10 health, and the more health you have, the, the better you are. While you have 40 or more health, troops you control have life drain, and then the upgraded text, while you have 60 or more health, um, your troops get plus five, plus five, and crush. Yep. Um, yeah, so Mother Dawn Breeze is going to be probably a nice one to play just for... Um, uh, what, what I think is your party passive is not amazing unless you're playing Warrior and you spec the ability that I think has been confirmed that even though the ability says um, you cannot choose to play first, what really is happening with warrior is you're losing the coin flip every time. Mm -hmm. So if you're just going for a warrior that wants to start with a ton of health, this would be a great mercenary to have in your party. And she seems like she'd be really good to play for um, a deck trying to go for um, Holy Ascension mm -hmm. because the health gain on her is great and Holy Ascension could make, um, I think it makes everything in your party like invincible. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's just, it would be a fun thing to do with Mother Dombries. And you have access to four legendaries and diamond, which would be perfect for that. Also, I was thinking about this, about the party passive. Um, if you're going to lose the coin flip and you know that you're going to gain that additional three health, it's another chance to proc those ethereal healers at the start <laughs> of the true. game. So yeah, yeah th that's going to be a lot of fun out there for, um, I, I know a lot of warrior decks were, or, or Yasi's, uh, war, what, Shin Hair, Blood, Blood Diamond with ethereal healers just coming out of the gate. Really, really strong. That That's going to be really, no, that's, is that, I'm thinking of a different thing. I'm thinking Maybe, of... Uh, no, Shinra Warrior. Yeah, yeah. Shinra Warrior is one. It, it's just the only downside is is if you do choose to do that for whatever um, speed deck you're playing, do you benefit by being on the, the draw? Because that's a downside. If, um, if you play that for Warrior to guarantee the three health, then you know that you're basically on the draw, so you're not playing first. Well, okay, this is the timing question. Is At the start of the game... If you do get the ethereal healers, then is that that that's at the coin flip, right? So that means that that's, the oh, ethereal okay. healers can attack that on on that first turn, or do you have to wait a turn? That's a 
good question. Huh. It's, it's interesting because I don't know how that would process. Um, I think your healers would still get to attack because that healing would happen before you draw for your, you know, for your deck. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think that they would still be considered being in play before the game starts. Okay. And it's different than having a troop with Kiss of the Princess with the equipment in your hand. Because Kiss of the Princess is you, the, the you start the turn and the card is in your hand and then the troop comes into play. So you cannot attack with a troop, a one cost human troop if it was procced off of Kiss of the Princess. But, yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, so so you know a little bit of testing will will be needed, but there's still a lot more mercenary, mercenaries to go through. Shay Lucia, um, the PVE mercenary, is a Fey, and it is able to summon a sea sp a seas pod, um, starting twenty two health, and when a plant enters play under your control, exhaust up to one opposing non artifact troop, and that includes the seed as well, right? A seed pod is a plant. Yep, yep, sea pods are plants. And um, what's awesome about this card, too, is it says you can include up to four copies of any phase or plants in your deck. So for all the plant fans, which includes myself, um, you will be able to play a awesome plant-themed deck with her and then also get seed pods to summon and then also get benefits by going into hiding every time a plant transforms, which you can do very quickly if you're playing like Caliban's Cultivation or um, uh, Parallel Evolution. There's a bunch of ways you can do it. So um, it will be, I think it'll be a lot of fun to play here. So, and, and just so that we're clear, it's when a plant transforms or not, not when something transforms into a plant. So for, exactly there like is plant a slight garden difference. would not count because it's yeah. a constant. So yeah, all right. Moving right along, there we got a lot more mercenaries to go through. We have Diamore Lathe. Um, this is going to be the Venom Cleric. Target opposing champion invokes and move each bane in your deck up five spaces. And those banes are going to be those terror eggs or those spider eggs. And at the start of your turn, create a spiderling egg for each opposing champion. Um, this is basically trying to if you didn't have a venom cleric deck this champion is your venom cleric deck right here add in hatchery cultivator add in any sort of add in some of the built-in or the tribunal ministry or the lookouts that are available in pve and th this deck just um seems like a beast and it starts with 21 health so um why not play this particular deck if you love eggs yeah, uh, this is probably the best thing we've seen for spiders. Like even more so than anything we've seen for any of the vending classes. Mm -hmm. This is by far um, just the best for spider tech. Like if you want to play spiders and mess with your opponent, if you want to play Fenteo's gift and mess with your opponent, this is the best mercenary to play. Better than all of the campaign characters so far from what I've seen. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Well, I, I want to know how many Brood Baron deaths we're going to have or or a Brood Baron and a Hatchery Cultivator in play at the same time. You just you essentially triple the number of of eggs in your opponent's deck. Moving right along, we have Count Davian, and this is a, a mercenary that I know a lot of players already have. I, I believe it was in the set one, um, set one chess. And yep. it, it is exactly what you would think it would be. It's going to be your vampire mercenary. Yeah, and the upgrade text is pretty amazing. Like, your thirst for blood passive power and said transforms a troop into a vampire princess, which makes me think that the conditional text is still there where it could instead um, choose the other text, which I can't quite read it from here. Or game to health. Out. Gain two health, yeah. So you might not get a Vampire Princess at all. You might just gain two health. But if you're playing a removal-heavy deck and you're all already playing the Vampires, that's just real big bonus incentive there to, to try this out. And you do have that that um, passive that's a negative passive, which at the end of your turn you lose two health. But that could be something you actually can combo with the deck because your champion is actually losing health. You're not... Um, 
it's not health is being taken away or something. So if you have cards in your hand that benefit or cards in play that benefit from you taking damage, that will um, that will be pretty good as well. I, I don't know if losing health is the same as taking damage, but um, I guess that would be something we'd have to test. Yeah, I'm pretty sure losing health and taking damage are different things. If you can prevent all damage, but losing one health is is slightly different with the Paladin of the Necropolis. I think we've experimented oh, yeah. where um, the Paladin of the Necropolis makes your opponent lose one health. It, it doesn't deal damage himself. Otherwise, his life drain would just continually go over and over again. Um, also, looking at Count Davian, I, I see this being a pure, purely mono blood. Um, the fact that you can have extinctions in your deck and wipe the board and possibly have vampires still alive on your side is absolutely, absolutely amazing for blood control. And I think a lot of um, a lot of players may not necessarily like want it for the party passive. Yes, it's going to be an, another ethereal healer buff, but at the same time, I think Count Davian is going to be just really, really strong for anyone that wants to try and play blood control through chapter two. Moving right along to the transcended, 19 health, um, I can't quite, yeah, that game text is extremely, extremely strong. You get meditating until you are damaged. And I think it's game text was basically saying, if you are meditating for two turns in a row, um, then you get a card, a random card with enlightened in its name, and you put it into your hand and you gain that threshold. I don't know how many enlightened cards there are currently in the game. I haven't checked myself, I, so I'm not sure either. But um, maybe there will be more with the next set. Yeah, he, he's pretty neat. I, I think that the meditating stuff could be difficult to pull off, but you might know the right time to activate the power. Um, and the the most interesting thing with him really is the shard grid, where you can't play rares or legendaries, only commons and uncommons. Yeah, it's um, going to be really interesting. And, and I'm wondering if... Like I wouldn't put it pack hex, put it past hex, and to like put hidden sort of things within the game where, um, like certain difficulties you have to beat, you know, the Kraken with the Dingler King. Like you have to turn him into a Dingler, or or, or do <laughs> or do really really strange things and and some crazy reward. Maybe that is how you get the alternate R Kraken. You beat him with the Dingler King. By turning them into a dingler, um, that would be hilarious. That would that would be hilarious, and and if if that really is the way it is, I I I, I promise I did not know none of that was revealed to me. But I, I'm hoping that there's going to be some of these Easter eggs. Um, they said that uh, what Chronicles of Entrath Chapter Two was going to be larger um, by far, and and it's looking like it is at least with all the mercenaries that we're looking at as we move on to Tafford the tireless. A 22 health um, human cleric, uh, summon a random troop with cost equal to the number of constants you control. At the start of your turn, each champion uh, each champion with three or more troops in their equip loses two health. What's your take? So I like his upgrade text where you can create eternal use. I think that um, for, for me initially looking at this guy, he seemed a little bit more difficult to build around. Like... The theme is constants, so you might want to splash wild and maybe play some of the lyrical chanters. Um, you might want to go five shard and and go rainbow and get all those pretty good constants into play. I, I'm not sure. It, when it comes to constants, my, my brain sometimes locks up a little bit because I, I don't often play them. I, I know ruby constants are the, the best for damage, so you might want to play like the um, fire chance and yeah, three chance. fulminations and heart of fire. But um, other than that, like uh, it's kind of hard for me to think about the best way to go here. You also have access to four of all diamonds. So maybe you're going to be playing incantation of righteousness and, and try to build more of a life, life drain focused deck because of the eternal use. So this could be another um, ethereal healer chassis to, to build around. All right. Yeah, I, I looked at this and I, I, I'm in the same boat as you. Constants are one of those cards that you, you play it and you know that it has a positive effect on the board, but it's not a troop. So the, a, a troop, you know that in, in dire times, you can sacrifice it to pr 
to block a, block something, you know, gain five, like, you know, prevent five damage from coming in. Constance just seemed like I, I'm going to be doing my own thing in this corner off over here, trying to win in a separate way. And hopefully you don't try and mess with it and touch, touch it. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it is harder to both think about and play, play around. All right, moving right along to the triumvirate. We're down to our final three mercenaries for for this past week. And um, we've already touched on this already, the spirit of the triumvirate. Um, what you are trying to do is um, summon a dragon guard stalwart, wisdom, and what the basic power is, summon a dragon guard stalwart, wisdom, courage, and power. At the end of your turn, if you have played three or more non-resource cards this turn, add a wisdom counter to you. If you have held three... If you have gained three or more t health, or gained health three or more times this turn, um, add a courage counter. If you have control three or more troops that dealt damage to an opposing champion this turn, add a power counter to you. Uh, basic one shot. Remove a, all three counters, and you transform into the triumvirate. Yeah. So another super hard ability to activate, like. <laughs> it sounds like it's going to be really hard. Like, how am I going to play three cards in a single turn, first off? Like, what kind of cards am I going to play to do that? Do I play a bunch of glyphs? Do I play a bunch of cards that just cycle? Um, and and if I'm not on my campaign character, how easy is that going to be? Because a lot of the easy cards to, to keep playing are the cycle cards you get in the campaign characters. But um, if you can figure out how to get around all three of those requirements then um, getting that triumvirate um, upgrade is going to be pretty awesome and rewarding. Um, in fact, there could be another achievement around getting a triumvirate and beating somebody with him. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll see, we'll see how that plays out. Yeah, and, and this is one of the things that um, is important to note is um, he, his upgraded text is a party passive and then an upgraded party passive. So... It, it's not like your typical text and then upgraded text for those of you, those of you eagle eye viewers out there. Oh, oh interesting. Okay, oh, no, that's like really that. good. I, I didn't, I didn't even realize that looking at it. So, no, that, that's that's really good to know. I I need to pay more attention to um, how you how they are doing the party passes. So instead of upgrading your mercenary to get bonus abilities on that mercenary, sometimes you're just getting bonus. Um, stats for your party mm -hmm. so yeah so there, there's a lot of room for mercenaries different types of upgrades um if you look at dynamo like excuse me going back to the top of the tire list you see the text and then the upgraded text and then gaining and then the party passive so and um, that's the difference there if you guys didn't notice it doesn't have upgraded text it has upgraded party passive all right so let's go ahead and move right along to uh, well, the the last couple of cards that were spoiled: Mass Produce and Dynamo Whistle. Uh, Mass Produce is summon X replicas of target troop. Um, kind of strange that you have a Kyoto there. I, I I always thought replicas were more of a of a dwarf thing, unless those Kyotos are ready to like shoot that Kyoto in the back. And then we have the Dynamo Whistle, which allows you to. Uh, just create a whole bunch of scrapyard dynamos and and put them into play. Put them into play. Yeah, so creating artifacts is going to be um, fun because there's already a lot of synergy around creating artifacts. So if you can do that with a artifact in play that has no cost, that's that's going to be nice to help you chain those things. Whether it's warp steel widgets or um, a war machinist in play. And uh, mass produced to your point, there is that card replica reinforcements that also has Kyodal images on there. So I think they're trying to move to like Kyodal having some kind of theme around um, creating replicas of them, even though they might not be really into robotics. Uh, I don't know. It seems like there's some lower shifting that way. Mm -hmm. um, and then the trinket equipment for mass produced is cool because I think what it, it does is it just repeats the text. So instead of summoning X once, you're summoning X twice. Um, and what I really like about Mass Produce as a card is um, I immediately think of ways to reduce its cost so that instead of paying three plus X plus X, maybe I'm only paying plus X plus X. So for four resources, maybe I'm already creating two replicas mm -hmm. or four replicas if that trinket works the way I think it does. 
Yeah, it, it doesn't say instead has. It has is your mass produced have so summon x replica rep, x replicas of target troop maybe you should say 2x and say instead but yeah. that would that would be a little bit confusing as well and uh, moving right along we still have two more cards to show the niblin swarm and pained existence niblin swarm seven costs double wild threshold um I believe it costs six, and it says this gets attack equal to this troop's attack, and this gets a defense equal to this troop's defense. So the Niblin Swarm can grow out of control very, very quickly, and also gets crush if you have that weapon slot. So very, very nice there. Also, the Swarming Fingers reduces its cost for each Niblin you control. Niblin is um, a is a troop type i believe there's a niblin skirmisher and then the niblin hunting party or the two niblins that uh, currently jump out to me i don't know of any other niblins right now yeah those are the only two i can think of as well and, and maybe that mass produce would be good in a niblin theme deck maybe you can mass produce a niblin skirmisher or something so that you can get this niblin swarm into play a lot earlier um so yeah it's pretty interesting and then there's that pained existence, which I don't think many people have seen. I actually completed a crossword puzzle and then landed on this card as a spoiler after completing the crossword puzzle. So um, I don't know how many people have actually seen this card, but it, it's kind of nice because it's a basic action that um, deals damage. Um, the troops get permanent effect on them that say at the start of your turn, this deals one damage to your champion. So it could be pretty fun to play on like a... Um, uh, what's what's that new card that came out? The the guy, the corrupted something that puts a deals two damage to your champion at the beginning of each turn. Is that the Count Davian? No, it's oh. a it's a PvP card in set five. I can't, I can't think of its name, but um, yeah, there's there's this new card that's a goblin that puts a, a similar debuff on an enemy troop. Mm. So nefarious I, corruptor. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. So kind of similar to that. Anyway, um, I think it would be pretty fun to to play with that if you're if you know you're going up against an encounter that has a bunch of um, troops that they flood the board with. Yeah, and also if you if you want to try and work around this, you can also play a lot of life drain troops or yourself because this does say each troop so all troops in play get this ability and if you do and it says at the start of your turn this deals one damage to you so if you have life drain you negate it and then you in addition gain life and um what is it hunger of the mountain god no oh yes hunger of the mountain god yeah this is great with that and even the um fury of the mountain god that gets reduced cost mm -hmm. so yeah th this card would, would work very well with a lot of the orc themed mountain god cards and it just happens to be ruby blood so yeah, it's, it's it seems like it was made for it all right so hopefully you guys enjoyed it and i know a lot of you guys out there are wanting to try and find new ways to get some more mercenaries i think um I'll have to check my inventory of mercenaries, see how many I have left. I don't want to give them all away before I even know what they do. So I'll, I'll say for right now, um, this this puzzle will definitely have uh, mercenaries, those Gen Con mercenaries from last year is given away. And then we may go back to uh, the 2016 convocation for next, um, for next time. But why don't you go ahead and dive into this particular puzzle right now? Okay, so Ewell is our puzzle man now, so thanks again, Ewell. Um, I actually got another puzzle from somebody that we might try next week, but we have we have a third one waiting from Ewell as well. So this particular puzzle, the enemy has 11 life. He has an all of the family in play. And he's, he's actually, he's probably the first person in the world that's actually activated all in the family. So you can see that there's five troops in play that are all invincible. And... Um, on, on play or in play for you is a profane ritualist that is a 4-4 four, four, and a scrapyard bruiser that is a 2-2. Two, two. And then you have three cards in your hand. Um, one of the cards, you can see the ruby card, has a little bit of text at the bottom that says, when you play this, copy it. You only have one resource and you only have two thresholds, um, just enough to play those three cards. If you look at the cards, you can tell that not, none of them are troops. I don't know if that's kind of a spoiler, but you can see that the card alludes to, you know, the bottom border. There is no attack. There is no defense. So um, 
what in the world can you play for a single resource to win the game? Um, and you are probably going to need some kismet on your side, as the puzzle alludes to. So thanks to you. I think this is a pretty fun one. Send me the sequencing and, and the answer to, to my email, and then if you get it right, you'll be in the entry for one of those awesome mercs. So I um, hope you guys are enjoying the puzzles. Um, we enjoy your feedback, so feel free to leave, leave us feedback either um, on Corona's YouTube page and, and like it if you have time and subscribe. And then also um, feedback either on um, iTunes or um, on the forums, any either uh, media. Just it's nice to hear from you guys and um, and come to us with more puzzles. It's it's always cool to get new puzzles in, and we will um, we will definitely um, compensate you for your time. All right. Well, I guess we we've been going long these past couple of weeks because of all of the spoilers and all the all the content we had to go over. But once again, I want to say thanks for watching. Thanks for listening from all of us here at Cornerstone. We hope to see you in a, in a game of hex, and hopefully, um, may you not have to mull again when you face us. <laughs> or maybe you have to mull again, and I win. I don't mind that either. You know. Oh, oh come on. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay, guys, have a good one. We'll catch you next Monday. And um, should we mention that you're going to be out of the country for a while? We might not have our our podcast for a few weeks. Yeah, that, that's going to be that's going to be coming up in December. So during oh, the Christ, during the Christmas break, um, I, I think a lot of us will be will be out and about. So we'll, the the show will come back in in 2017, better better than ever. And hopefully, we'll have. I'll try to like sneak into the hex offices and see what else we, we can grab. And, and get for you guys out there all right man well thanks for listening we'll catch you next time